Wildlife by Cynthia de Felice. Chapter 11. Eric's heart leaped, then sank, as Dr. Bob continued talking. It's a fellow by the name of Mike Dubichin. He lives down near Bismarck. He brought some of his dogs up this way last week to hunt sharp tails, just the way I figured. And this pup took off on him, says she. he called and whistled and drove around looking for her, but finally he had to leave. He just left Quill behind? Eric asked incredulously. Who? Oh, is that what you're calling her? Dr. Bob chuckled. Cute. Anyway, Dubichin said it was getting dark and he couldn't spend all night looking. He had to get home. He didn't know anything about the porcupine. He can't come today, but he thinks he'll be able to get up this way tomorrow or the next day. Oh, Eric said weakly. How's the dog doing? Eric looked at Quill, who was over in the corner sniffing a pair of Oma slippers, and smiled despite of himself. Great, he said. She acts like nothing ever happened. That's the beauty of dogs, Dr. Bob said. They don't dwell on the past. Any swelling? Maybe just a little. Is she eating? Venison, ham, and eggs so far, Eric told him. Dr. Bob laughed and said, Nothing but the best, huh? Well, listen, it's no problem for me to keep her until Duvachin can come for her, but it doesn't look as if I'll be able to get there until maybe six o'clock. Is that going to be soon enough for Big Daryl? Eric thought about the way his grandfather's cold blue eyes had flattened when he first saw Quill, and the look on his face when he said, Take that mud out to the barn. I guess it'll have to be, he said. All right, then, I'll see you tonight. Eric forced himself to say thanks before hanging up. Quill, who was curled on the rug next to the bed, got to her feet and came over to him. Eric took her head in his hands, and they looked into each other's eyes. Dr. Bob's call made it final. Even if, by some miracle, Big Daryl had relented and let Quill stay another night, she was going back to her owner. He thought about Quill returning to this Duvachin guy, who obviously didn't care about her anywhere near as much as Eric did, or he'd never have left her behind to contend with a porcupine all, all, all on her own. He thought about going to school the next day, a prospect daunting in itself. Then he imagined coming home at the end of the day to this sagging, unhappy house. Oma was nice, he had to admit, and he felt how hard she was trying to make him feel at home. But any welcoming warmth she created was blotted out by the dark, ominous presence of Big Daryl. He couldn't stand it. And suddenly, a plan came to him, breathtaking in its perfection and simplicity. He would leave and take Quill with him. He had a shotgun and shells. He had Quill. They would live off the land together. After all, they were in a place where one could hardly swing a dead cat without hitting a pheasant. A place where birds and, de and deer and jackrabbits were more plentiful than human beings. And while the land was empty of people, it was full of places to hide. No one would ever find them if they didn't wish to be found. Big Daryl would be positively thrilled, if Big Daryl was ever actually thrilled about anything, to find them gone. Eric hesitated when he thought about Oma, remembering her pleased expression when he'd hugged her and the feel of her hands on his back when she had hugged him in return. But he was sure that his being there only made her life with Big Daryl harder. He thought of his parents halfway across the world. They're the ones who sent me here and said to make the best of it, and that's what I'm doing, he told himself. He glanced at the clock on Oma's, Oma's bedside table. It was a few minutes before nine. That gave him plenty of time for a good head start in case anyone came looking for him. He thought about what he'd need to take with him. His mother had told him about how crazy and extreme the weather in North Dakota could be. He wasn't 100% sure he believed that she had gotten badly burned while sunbathing one morning and frostbitten later the same afternoon, or that she used to watch the whitecaps in Oma's bird bath. But he gathered up all his warmest clothes, including rain gear, and stuffed them into his backpack. He added his wallet, but left his cell phone on the dresser. It was useless here, and there was no one he wanted to call. He and Quill were going to make it on their own. Kids in pioneer days didn't have phones. He grabbed his toothbrush from the bathroom and headed back to Dan's room. The shotgun shells went into the pack. Next, he tied the old camping mess kit and the canteen onto the outside of the pack by their straps. 
From the box, he took Elvis's collar, which he placed around Quill's neck, and the leash, which he used to lash the sleeping bag to the bottom of the pack. He was putting on the camouflage jacket when Dan's hunting boots caught his eye. They looked sturdier than his own hiking boots, so he decided to try them on. They were a little roomy, but not bad at all when he put on two pairs of thick wool socks from Dan's drawer. He picked up the gun, closed the closet door, and surveyed the room. There was no obvious sign that he'd been there. Oma or Big Daryl would have to come in and look in the closet to notice anything was missing, and somehow he doubted they would suspect right away that he'd been in Dan's room. Carefully he closed the door behind him and went downstairs, Quill at his heels. In the kitchen, he gathered a big box of matches, which he put in a plastic baggie, and a couple of larger plastic bags for keeping his gear dry in case of rain. Opening cabinets and pulling out drawers, he looked for other things he might need and found a Swiss Army knife and another longer knife. He and Quill would hunt for their food, of course, but just to be on the safe side, he raided the refrigerator for some cheese, a package of bologna, and two apples. From the pantry, he took a pack of cookies, the remains of a loaf of bread, a nearly full jar of peanut butter, and a box of crackers. Then he filled the canteen with water. Looking around the kitchen, he couldn't think of anything he had forgotten. His eyes fell on the notepad and pen sitting by the phone. He imagined Oma coming home from church to find him gone, and he remembered her saying to Dr. Bob, I can't have anything happening to Eric. He's my daughter Darlene's boy, you know. On the notepad, he wrote, Dear Oma, Quill and I went for a walk, so I packed a lunch. Dr. Bob is coming by for her around six. He read it over. It implied, without actually saying, that he and Quill planned to be back in time to meet Dr. Bob. Nothing he'd written was an outright lie. He and Quill were going for a walk. He just hoped the note would buy them some extra time. He signed it. Your grandson, Eric. Hoisting his pack onto his back, he called to Quill. Together they headed out into the wide and windy prairie. Chapter 12 The sun shone brightly in the cloudless sky, and Eric shaded his eyes against the glare. As he looked around at the miles of unpopulated countryside stretching as far as he could see, a feeling of exhilaration rose in him. From this moment on, he realized, every decision was his to make. Not only that, there, these were going to be real decisions, important ones, having to do with staying alive. He had one simple job, he told himself, to live off the land. The challenge quickened his blood. First decision, which way to go? He adjusted the pack on his back, shouldered the shotgun, and called to Quill, who seemed to have caught the scent of his excitement and was racing happily across the driveway toward the road. When she returned, he explained to her, that they would be staying away from roads, crossing them only when necessary, and when they were certain they wouldn't be seen. This wasn't nearly as difficult as it would have been back home, because the roads out here were few and far between. He'd noticed that, for the most part, they ran north and south and east to west, dividing the land in huge blocks that were several miles long on every side. That made a lot of space in which a boy and a dog could disappear. Also, in those wide open spaces, he could see or hear a car coming miles before it got close enough to worry about. First, he decided they would head for, cover, for the cover of the line of trees he had spotted the night he arrived. From the car, the land had appeared flat and empty to him. But now, as he moved across it on foot, it told a different story. There were subtle dips and gentle mounds in the earth, and places where the rain had washed deep ditches. ditches. There were low spots where cattails and brush grew around the edges of little ponds called potholes. At home, that meant a hole in the road that caused the car to lurch and his father to say bad words. But his mom had told him about prairie potholes, which were rounded depressions in the earth that had been left behind by glaciers. Nowadays, they held rainwater and snowmelt. Some of them were the size of a backyard swimming pool, others as far across as a football field. There were patches of scrubby trees and small stands of woods and gullies and ravines. There were odd objects people had left behind. A rusty farm implement, an old watering trough, the foundation of a building long gone, a pile of rocks cleared from a field. Eric noted with satisfaction that all of these provided cover where he and Quill could hide if need be. He imagined that pheasant and deer hid 
in those same kinds of places. Eric was also pleased to see that Quill with her mottled coat blended in well with the rocks and dirt and grass, and he congratulated himself on his own clothing, faded jeans, a gray t-shirt, Dan's camo jacket, and his own favorite camo print baseball cap. When they reached the trees, he turned to the south. He didn't have a compass, but he noticed where the sun had come up the past two mornings and where it had set, so he knew which way was south. He figured they'd move carefully, far from the eyes of anyone driving on the road, and use this first day to put as many as much distance as they could between themselves and his grandparents' farmhouse. He chose south as their direction because he knew that Canada wasn't far to, wasn't far to the north. Back in New York, when he'd gone to Canada with his parents for a weekend vacation, they had crossed a big bridge where they had to show their passports to the guards and answer questions about where they were born and what they were planning to do in Canada. He didn't know what the border was like out here, but he wasn't taking the chance of being spotted or questioned. When Eric looked back, his grandparents' house was already no more than a speck in the distance. A V of geese flew high overhead, honking urgently to one another, reminding Eric of the question framed in the picture his mother had drawn. He had found the answer. This, he felt sure, was how he was meant to live his life, his one wild life, with his gun on his shoulder and his dog by his side, free to go where he pleased in a wide and wild place. With no grown-ups to give orders and hold him back, he had only the supplies he could fit in his pack and his own wits and courage, and that was all he needed. Stay tuned next time for Chapter 13.